You know, the, uh, we've been in the midst of a series on Galatians, a marvelous uh, focus on the reality that salvation is a gracious gift of God received solely by faith. And that having begun by faith, we don't continue by works, we continue by faith, the walk of the Christian. And so uh, Paul, Paul uh, introduces a subject of, of what does it mean to be spiritual in this, uh, in this book, uh, Galatians chapter 5, what does spirituality look like? And last week we focused on that. Tom said that when we connect with God through Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, that's what it means to be spiritual. What God produces in the life of the believer, um, he begins to produce the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, these characteristics of God that are true both in the Old Testament and the New Testament that now become ours by virtue of the influences and presence of, of, of the Holy Spirit himself, producing truly fruit of his activity and of his presence there. Once we become united with Christ, and we have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, we now are called to live by that very same spirit that brought us to himself and now has promised to uh, guide us in this journey, this walk. And so we walk by the spirit of God. The very instant that we are born again, we are saved truly, fully, and completely, we can put a full stop there. There's nothing more to be added to our salvation and certainly nothing can be taken away from that. Uh, however, we must learn that that's the beginning of a process, a process of spiritual growth. Um, the Apostle Paul in Romans, I think, uh, helps us out with this. You remember the very familiar verse in Romans chapter five, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the blessed reality that is th the believers, we are at peace with God and his peace is within us. It's a, an active ongoing, uh, well, evidence of our having been reconciled with him. And so we have peace. But it's interesting that next verse, he says, Jesus Christ, through whom we have also obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. Yes, we stand in this grace, and that's our salvation, but notice that word, our introduction into this. That suggests that there's something ongoing that follows after that, and that's san sanctification. That's that process by which we are being progressively conformed to the image and likeness of Christ. And indeed, it is a journey. It begins at the new birth and does not end until the day we see Christ in heaven. There is positional sanctification, kind of a synonym for being born again, becoming the new creation. There is the process of sanctification, this progressive influence of the Spirit of God working within the believer, really enabling us to be growing into the likeness of Christ. And then there's final sanctification. Sanctification, and that's, what, that's when it's all done. That's when, when the day we die, we close our eyes to the last time, and the very next vision is what theologians call the beatific vision. We gaze upon the glories of Christ in heaven. And so sanctification. So there's both salvation, which is finished, and there's sanctification that's ongoing. We are indeed on a journey. We are pilgrims in this journey. Um, we could speak of pilgrim's progress. We, we desire to progress in this journey uh, of growth and Christ-likeness. Uh, we recognize that in this life we're not home yet. And then the more I look out on this world, the more I'm convicted I'm not home yet. I do not identify with what I see in the world. And one of the kind of the blessings of a world going to hell in the handbasket is increasingly that is my conviction. I do not identify with this world. I may be a citizen of America, but a greater devotion I have to heaven, that I am a citizen of heaven, from which place we eagerly await our Savior and the conclusion of this work, this ongoing work within us. We are again uh, um, on a journey to the promised land, and we recognize, I think, the infinite variety of many times mysterious ways in which God weaves together the experiences of our life, 
in this process of sanctification and spiritual growth. It is an ongoing work of construction by the master carpenter. Um, We are his workmanship. We are a product of Jesus' work within us, shaping and fashioning and hammering and and tearing away and uh, starting over, it seems like at times. Uh, But he is the master carpenter doing his perfect work, a master architect, a master um, engineer, certainly a master artist in this holy work of sanctification. Um, And this is a reality that the recipients of the letter to the Hebrews needed to learn. And it's something I think that we need to learn more of, that God delights to leverage all the circumstances of life in the service of his perfect will for us. And he does so in the setting of our lives. Just the, the tug and the, and the pull and the, the daily walk, and at times we would call it the grind of life, and the, the dark periods and the, um, the difficult periods of time. And yet we know by faith God is at work within us, willing and working for his good pleasure. I mean, that's what Paul says to the Philippians. We find ourselves this morning in the book of Hebrews, a a marvelous, kind of a pastoral letter uh, that we can learn much from, uh, written largely to a body of Jewish believers, hence the book to the Hebrews. Uh, In some cases, almost believers. He addresses them almost like a pastor. Some are believers, some are thinking they're believers and they're not. And so there's a whole range of people there, but he addresses them largely as believers. And and because of increased persecution and they're being ostracized by their society, um, just the pressures of life, the insecurities that, that we all have, they were being tempted to return to an Old Testament system of righteousness, an Old Testament religion. And his argument is that you are, you are giving up all that the Old Testament pointed to. And so you're going backwards, you're not going forwards. And so this is, this book, and in fact this passage, is a sober challenge to carefully consider what you are about to do, Hebrew Christians, or Hebrew almost Christians. You're about to abandon the gospel. You're about to fall away from grace, from faith or at least what you think was grace and what you think was faith. You're about to identify as an apostate. The word means to stand off away from. To stand off away from Christ, to to deny Christ. And he says in, I think, verse 12, this is the mark of an evil, unbelieving heart. And so this is indeed a sober warning. Many in the evangelical world two weeks ago were surprised to hear, were stunned to hear the story of Joshua Harris, a prominent pastor who abandoned the gospel and says openly uh, that I no longer identify as a Christian. I mean, it was a shocking admission. Here's an individual at the age of 20 who wrote a million seller book on dating, I Kissed Dating Goodbye. And then he uh, went on to lead a church, a very large influential church, Covenant Life Church in Gaithersburg, Maryland. He abandoned his marriage of 20 years and now is apologizing to the LGBTQ community for his perverse ideas about marriage and and them not being uh, able to be a Christian and to stay in their, their lifestyle. I mean, it was a shocking thing to think of someone like that that would abandon in just very clear words. He says, I no longer identify as a Christian. Shocking. One of the individuals who knew him as he was growing up, a little bit older than him, but saw him as a child and growing up, he uh, wrote an open letter about him and uh, speculated out loud, did you ever truly know what it means to be a believer? Did you ever know the gracious work of God which is salvation? Or had you reduced everything to simply behavior, to legalism? Because his book on dating has echoes of that. We don't know, but we know this, that he has abandoned the gospel. Have you reduced 
the, the gospel to some rigid code of ethics and behavior? Um, Paul says, this is Christianity. 1 Timothy 1, verse 5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's the gospel. Yes, there's behavior associated with that, but behavior comes forth from this gracious work of God on the soul. In that same chapter, Paul warns about Hymnaeus and Alexander who had forsaken the faith and a good conscience. They had forsaken walking by faith and maintaining a clear conscience, and they were in danger of suffering shipwreck in regard to their faith. That's a sober warning there. Now, such a thing doesn't happen overnight. In fact, it doesn't happen at night. It happens in daylight. It happens in the presence of truth. That's the tragedy. It happens in the light of truth. Now the author of Hebrews is calling upon them to carefully consider what they were on the verge of doing. And he appeals to the Old Testament examples of Israel in the wilderness. The Exodus, the the meeting at Mount Sinai, the wilderness journey, and on to the promised land there as a way of challenging his people to avoid that, um, that end that they found themselves in. A failure of faith, a refusal to follow God and to believe God. So let's go ahead and start in on Hebrews 3 and see what the Lord would would say to us uh, about this important issue of faithfulness, what it means to live by faith in this life. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1, therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession. That word consider is an interesting word, katanaeo, and it really has the idea, it implies attention and continuous observation. I mean, fix your thoughts on these things, on Jesus. Put your mind on Jesus and let it remain there for a while. I remember growing up and my dad would say, you're letting that stuff go into one ear and out the other, and it doesn't lodge long in between. And uh, that was probably true. And what the author of Hebrews has in mind here is no, let it lodge long in between. Listen, carefully consider what you are about to give up, Hebrew so-called Christian. And he says, consider Jesus the apostle of our confession. Apostle simply means a sent one. This is the greatest sent one of God. This is the one who was inaugurated by God. He says, thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. And he became a high priest as appointed by God, not by virtue of some human requirement that you were born of the tribe of Levi, and so you're automatically a priest. No, he is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek, meaning having been appointed directly by God. And so consider carefully Jesus this, notice he says, this high priest, that Jesus is our high priest. By the way, a very dominant theme in the entire book of Hebrews. He is called our great high priest, our sympathetic high priest. He's called and appointed directly by God as a high priest. He is described as holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. He is one who has taken his seat as high priest at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. And by the way, he is the one, Hebrews says, that has entered into a heavenly tabernacle and sprinkled his blood there in the presence of God, rather than simply and merely entering into a tabernacle made with human hands. No, he entered into heaven and once for all accomplished redemption, having sprinkled his blood on that heavenly altar. In short, you are about to abandon that supreme, superior high priest, the one who can make peace with God on your behalf. In fact, Paul says he is our peace. It's not simply that he makes peace, he is our peace. He is salvation to us. Notice verse two, 
He was faithful to him who appointed him, meaning Jesus was faithful to God the Father who appointed him, as we've said, as Moses also was in all of his house. In other words, comparing him to Moses, the great lawgiver. I mean, there are two great pillars of the faith in the Old Testament, and certainly Abraham is one, the father of the Hebrew people, and Moses is the other, the great lawgiver. I mean, they dominate throughout the Old Testament, and so here we have the author of Hebrews saying, listen, consider how much greater a, 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 a servant of God Jesus was and is than even Moses, for he has been considered, counted worthy of more glory than Moses, by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. Yes, Moses was faithful in what he was constructing on behalf of the nation of Israel, but Jesus is a greater builder and a master planner. And he is far more faithful in the work that he accomplished, namely the accomplishing of redemption such that there can now be a church, and we all are individually priests. Verse 4, for every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later, meaning really the true significance of what Moses accomplished was pointing to a greater work of construction, and that would be what Jesus accomplished. Yes, Moses was a kind of savior, uh, a physical savior, but Jesus was a spiritual savior that accomplished redemption by virtue of his one death that he offered to God. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are. I mean, that's what we're called, right? We are the body of Christ. He is our head, we are the members, we are oriented by, we find our life in Jesus, our Savior and Lord. If we hold fast our confidence and boast of our hope firm to the end. In other words, that's alluding to the fact that some were wavering to the point of thinking about contemplating even abandoning Christ. And so this is a sober challenge. And so he justifies this challenge or he kind of uh, gives evidence for uh, uh, why this is such a serious thing by appealing to the Old Testament experience of Israel in the wilderness. And so he cites Psalm 95 in the next couple of verses here, uh, where he is, uh, this psalm is a a marvelous psalm of praise and trust in God, but also a warning against unbelief. The first part of that psalm he doesn't quote, it's it's familiar words, O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord, let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation, let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, let us shout joyfully to him with psalms, and he goes on and on and on, and then these sober words uh, in uh, verse, uh, what, seven and following here in Hebrews three, this warning against doing what Israel did, and they perished ultimately in the wilderness and failed to find rest in the promised land. I mean, this is, again, as I've said, a sober warning. Look at verse 7. He presses this analogy. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they, those Israelites in the wilderness, provoked me. They saw, they heard, they experienced, and yet what? They were indifferent, they were hardened, they were stiff-necked. I mean, if you go back there and search through the divine descriptions of Israel in the wilderness, it is really not a pleasant thing to behold. Stiff-necked, obstinate, always going backward, denying me, not follow. I mean, it really goes on and on and on about that. Verse 9, this in the wilderness where your fathers tested me, It's almost like, I dare you, God. It's like in the face of obvious evidence that you're here in our presence, denying it. He sought to lead these Hebrews in the wilderness, but they simply would not follow. He performed multiple miracles with a view towards convincing them to follow him, to trust him as as equipping to enable them to enter into the promised land and enjoy the rest that he had, had promised. And yet they refused. 
I mean, they were not simply unpersuaded. They increasingly were unpersuadable. I mean, if you're not convinced by the parting of the Red Sea and the opening up of the ground to, to, to kill off the, the rebellion at Korah and the fire out of heaven on top of Mount Sinai and the pillar of fire by, uh, by night and the, and the cloud by day that would lead them throughout the wilderness, I don't know what is going to convince you. And they weren't convinced and they were hardened. Notice verse 10. I was angry, therefore, with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and they do not know my ways. By the way, that alludes to what he was trying to accomplish in the midst of the wilderness experience. Oh, that you might know my ways. All of the experiences were being used of God to to draw them closer. It was not a gospel of rigid obedience. Many people have the mistaken impression that the Old Testament is all about law and the New Testament, that's where we find grace. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. We find grace at the heart of the law. Many times when he challenges them to obey, he talks about love. That you, the, the whole verse that says you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that's first found in the Old Testament. That is the call. And yet Israel was resistant to that. He sought to teach them, he sought to lead them, and they simply refused to listen, and they became hardened, and therefore the judgment fell on many in the wilderness. And that's the sad record of Israel's experience in the wilderness. In fact, at one point, the older generation had to die off to make room for the younger generation to grow up so that then, with those, they could enter into the promised land. That's how dire the situation had become. That's how hardened that older generation had become. That's how wedded they had become to their sin and to their way of life in Egypt, such that at multiple times they would long to return to the comforts of slavery in Egypt. Oh, that we might have the leeks and the onions of Egypt, where we had free food. I mean, that's precisely what they longed for and thereby were rejecting what food God had delighted to provide them in the midst of the wilderness. Manna from heaven, water out of the rock. And in all of these experiences, if you trace out the 40 years of wandering, it's very obvious what God is doing. He's using the circumstances of this journey to to challenge them, to wean them off of their sin, to equip them for the challenges that lay ahead, to perform a spiritual work in their hearts uh, that they might delight in what is good and pure. The author of Hebrews is addressing his audience and challenging them and saying, listen, consider Jesus who has come our great apostle sent by God, our great high priest who has accomplished a final work of redemption, far more faithful than Moses the lawgiver. And yet he cites this psalm about a thousand years earlier that reflects back a full 15 centuries at the experiences of Israel during that time of the exodus and the wilderness wanderings. And this is the basis for this sober warning. Learn from the record of Scripture, he's saying. Verse 12, take care, therefore, brethren. Take care is is simply the word see, look. And it's in the imperative. No, this is a command. Carefully look and see and consider. Take care, brethren. Notice he's calling them brethren. That's only used of believers, or at least those who would consider themselves believers. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that would fall away from the living God. I think if you'd walked up to some of those people in the wilderness, they never in a thousand years would have said, yes, I have an evil, unbelieving heart. But they were giving evidence of that creeping apostasy by their choices daily by their refusal to listen to God, to follow God, to obey God, by their willingness to substitute their own ideas for God's ideas. 
rebelling against the religion that God was inaugurating through Moses on top of Mount Sinai. I mean, they met for 11 months there at Mount Sinai with the giving of the law and the instruction of the people, and from that point on, they begin the journey to the promised land, and boy, they have the failure of faith there at Cadiz Barnea, and then they are doomed to wander in the wilderness for 38 more years, a total of 40 years. And so the author here in Hebrews just says, take care, brethren. You who think you're you're a believer, you who are a believer, take care that this not be found in you, in your rebellion against what God is doing in your life, in your response to the pain that you're experiencing, in your inability to understand what God is up to for crying out loud, for heaven's sake. I mean, isn't that an interesting phrase? What on earth is God doing for heaven's sake? That really should be the question. But many times our approach to the question is, what on earth is God doing? And we only have half the formula. No, what, is, what on earth is God doing for heaven's sake? In other words, what is God delighting to accomplish through the exigencies of life, through the, just the daily stuff of life? What is he doing? Take care, look at these things, consider these things, that you not find this kind of rebellious heart. Um, how, did, how did their heart become hardened? Well, in the presence of, of truth, in the presence of light, a persistent rejection of those things. Um, again, apostasy is willful. It is a deliberate standing off away from the truth. And and as we said, that doesn't happen overnight. It happens slowly as as a creeping thing. It's seeing and experiencing as they did these extraordinary wonders and just (sighs) not finding it all that impressive. And this is, I think, a sober word for you and I how we should view how it is that God is dealing with us. Again, take care, he says, lest you follow the tragic example of Israel in the wilderness. They perished. They never received the rest that God had promised in the promised land. Learn, he would say, from the inspired word of scripture that still stands to teach us, whether it be Psalm 95 or Exodus and and Deuteronomy. Um, Don't be like Israel in their disobedience. They'd seen and heard a lot, they'd experienced a lot, and yet, tragically, they perished in the wilderness. You know, the author of Hebrews actually answers the question why it is, despite all of the knowledge, despite all of the miracles they saw, he answers the question in the very next chapter on why they did. If you scan forward uh, Hebrews chapter four, verse two, he says this, indeed we have had good news preached to us just as they also, they saw a lot, they heard a lot from Moses' mouth for crying out loud, but the word they heard did not profit them. Why? Because it was not united by faith in those who heard. Remember Hymnaeus and Alexander having forsaken faith and a good conscience? That's the key to understanding how it is that apostasy happens, how it is that hardened hearts are hardened. It's a failure to view the difficulties, the trials, the stuff, the junk of life from from a perspective of faith. That God truly is Lord, sovereign, He is truly working in us and among us, delighting to do wonderful things in us and through us. Hebrews chapter three, the author is practicing by appealing to late earlier scripture, he's practicing what Paul elsewhere uh, exhorts us to do. In other words, as New Testament believers, benefit from the record of God's dealings with Israel in the Old Testament. Should we still study and read and have quiet times in the Old Testament? Absolutely. Many times we see the propositional truth of the New Testament illustrated in vivid color in the pictures and narrative of the Old Testament. So in many ways, it's easier to grasp some of these truths. 
And in the providence of God, God even in history is preparing all of humanity for these extraordinary spiritual truths by giving us limited um, uh, physical analogies, giving us the terms to understand redemption, giving us the concepts of redemption in the context, let's say, of uh, of the sacrificial system, sacrificing bulls and goats. And yet, there was no real efficacy to the sacrifice of these animals. Paul, I mean, the author of Hebrews in in chapter 10 will say, the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. So then why do we do that? Well, because in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins. A, A message from God, almost to the point of redundancy, that no amount of animal blood can take away your sin. And it was a temporary system uh, by which we could stay the hand of God's judgment by, in obedience, offering animal sacrifices, but always their genuine significance was in what they pointed to, namely, the Lamb of God who would would be slain for the sins of the world. That's why John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus, says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God would pass over sins previously committed in the Old Testament. God would completely remove sins by virtue of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, being slain for the sins of the world. That's what Hebrews argues there. And so we can indeed learn from the Old Testament as we get the pictures and the types and the illustrations and the concepts, but it's all pointing to the fullness of the revelation that would be accomplished in the New Testament but preeminently in the coming of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says in Romans 15, these things happened as examples and they were written for our benefit, that we might persevere, that we might be encouraged. He'll say in in 1 Corinthians 10, these things happened as examples and they were written for our benefit. Now that's an interesting statement because when it says these things, it's referring to Old Testament things, these things happened as examples, meaning that God is causing these things to unfold the way they did with a view towards them being written down and passed on to you and I. So in other words, it's not simply kind of an antiseptic history that someone later said, well, let's use this as a spiritual illustration. It's rather that God was orchestrating events in the Old Testament with views towards them being written down by inspired prophets and handed off to you and I. And we have the high privilege of seeking out and searching out the truths that are resident there and the fullness of what they pointed to, namely what we have in the New Testament. So that's what we find there. That's what the author of Hebrews is doing here. He's actually issuing a pastoral sobering challenge and he's he's appealing to earlier scripture as an illustration, as an analogy for why this is such a critical thing. So in the Exodus, the giving of the law, this gathering around Mount Sinai, the wilderness wanderings, all of it, these these stories, true historical stories, they have much to teach us in how God deals even with you and I. They're just not, you know, old, dusty stories that we shouldn't be concerned about. I think I'm going to title this message Pilgrim's Progress because I think that's really one of the big messages to take away. That we look at Israel in the wilderness wandering, the exodus, and it really is a journey. It is pilgrims headed to the promised land. Now, it's a sad, tragic example of that, but it is nonetheless a picture of the pilgrim's progress from salvation to um, the promised land. When I say pilgrim's progress, many of you recall the John Bunyan classic uh, uh, allegory called Pilgrim's Progress. It used to be the second most published book in all of human history because it's such a masterful treatment of the pilgrim's progress. We find the character Christian at the beginning of the book, the story burdened down by his sin. He represents all those who will one day come to know Christ. Therefore, his name is Christian. Christian. 
And he's burdened down by this weight of his own sin and he meets evangelist. And evangelist points him to the yonder narrow gate and he says, head that way and you shall find life. And so he journeys that way and by the way, he eventually gets saved. But boy, I'll tell you what, before and after, it is a long, winding, circuitous journey. And it's full of terrors and fearful things and deceptions and people who would turn him away and discourage him. He falls into the slew of despond and he reaches in hope against hope to the side closest to the celestial city, lest he turn back and return to the city of destruction. I mean, that's the, that where he came from. That's what he formerly was a citizen of, the city of destruction. Why the city of destruction? Because it destroys its citizens and because it is doomed to one day be destroyed. And Christian has become convinced that he must flee that city of destruction and head in hope against hope to that celestial city, the glow of God's glory on the horizon. I can't see it, but I'm pressing that direction. And boy, it is a frightening, fearful, terrifying journey that he must uh, travel. And it's a, a kind of picture t- for life. If you, if you think about it, and that's the, that's the point of Bunyan. I mean, that uh, we are in this journey, as it were, and it's not a cushy thing. I mean, the Hebrews, once they were uh, rescued from Egypt and they go through the waters of the parting of the Red Sea, they probably thought, you know, tomorrow we're going to be in promised land. And yet it was 38 more years later, a total of 40 years until some entered the promised land. And I'll tell you what, when you trace out the experiences of Israel in Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, boy, this is quite a journey. And I would argue it's a picture of, uh, of our walk in this life. We are pilgrims in progress on a journey headed towards the promised land. We have experienced our exodus from sin and oppression. Isn't that right? I mean, Israel found itself in bondage and slavery to the Egyptians and to Pharaoh, and yet God in mercy heard their cry and raised up a deliverer, a savior in Moses, and he, by the mighty outstretched right arm of God, rescued them out of their slavery and headed them on towards the promised land, and yet they wouldn't get there immediately. It would be through a long wilderness wandering that they would eventually find rest and hope. Isn't that what happens with us? I mean that we are rescued out of our spiritual slavery, slaves to sin, oppressed by, burdened down by our sin, walking according to the course of this world, and yet God in his mercy awakens within us an interest in life. And he begins the process of of change and conforming us ever more closely to the image of his son. And we are one day looking forward to salvation being complete in heaven. So we're led by our Savior through the wilderness journey, just like Moses would lead the children of Israel through their wilderness journey there. You know, Israel almost immediately experienced the challenges uh, there at the Red Sea and they become frightened and you know what their first impulse is? Ah, are there not enough graves in Egypt that you brought us out here um, to die in the wilderness? Leave us alone that we might serve the Egyptians. And you just say, wow, what darkness. And yet, with the belly aching that we sometimes find in us is that not sometimes in essence what we're doing is telling God to leave us alone that we make good go back to the good old days to the comforts of an old way of life not fully appreciating that no that was oppression that was death and yet he has rescued us out of that and he has promised us an eternal rest in heaven um Israel in the wilderness had a lot of soul work that needed to be done before they could enter into the promised land. 
And that's why the experiences that they had. They needed to be weaned off of many sins and their greedy and selfish desires. They lacked sufficient faith to make it onto the promised land and so that had to be wrought in them and built up in them. Hence, the experiences of the, uh, of the, the wilderness journey. They were weak and needed to be strengthened uh, for the journey ahead, the battles that they didn't know lay ahead but did in fact lay ahead. In other words, God had designed the wilderness journey to either on the one hand confirm the reality of their love of God or to expose the illusion of their devotion to God. That he had designed the journey such that they would be led to follow after God. In fact, in a very physical, visual way he does that. At one point in Numbers chapter 9, he talks about the the cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. He says, listen, if this thing stays there a day, you stay there a day. If it stays there a week or a month or whatever, you stay there. If it goes to the left, you go to the left. If it goes to the right, you go to the right. And it says all of this according to the command of the Lord. In other words, he is visually and physically cultivating within Israel a, a devotion to God and say, you know what, against my, what I see and hear, I'm going to follow you. That was the desire intent of God in leading Israel through the wilderness. And so they would be led, hopefully, to believe and trust in God. Now this is not just simply a facile treatment of the text. In Deuteronomy, Moses explicitly tells us that God was orchestrating all of these events to teach them and to lead them and to perform some work in them. If you can turn quickly, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. You can keep your finger in Hebrews 3 because we'll return at the end on that. But Deuteronomy chapter 8, this is an interesting passage written by Moses at the end of the 40 years of wilderness wandering. In other words, this is the divine commentary looking back on 40 years of God's dealing with Israel and helping us understand what was going on in this wilderness wandering. And it gives us some, I think, some good insight. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1. All the commandments that I am commanding you today you should be careful to do, that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to give to your forefathers. And here it is. You shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years. By the way, he literally was leading them in the wilderness, like I said. A cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night. Don't go there because I'm going here. That's what he's saying. He says he did that, notice the next phrase, that he might humble you. In other words, the way he was leading them, where he was leading them, what experiences they would indeed experience were purposefully designed to do what? To humble them. Moses, their great leader, is described by one attribute in particular, and that is humility. In the book of Numbers, it says Moses was a humble man more than any man on the face of the earth. I mean, humility is one of those chief virtues that God delights in. One of my favorite verses is Isaiah 66, 2, and it says, God is talking and he says this, but to this one I will look, to him who is humble and contrite of spirit and who trembles at my word. God has told us what individual he will look to, to work in and through, and that is humble, contrite of spirit, and one who trembles at my word. And that was evidenced in Moses, and that is what God was seeking to accomplish in Israel, that he might humble them, testing them to what? To know what was in your heart. Not that God would learn what was in their heart, because he already knew that. He's omniscient. I think that they would learn what was in their heart. That the difficulties and trials of the wilderness experience were specifically designed to, to expose the lack of faith in the heart of the people. You need to see, because of what lies ahead, and I know what lies ahead, you need to see what is in your heart. You need to be prepared for what lies ahead. 
Notice it says there in verse three, he humbled you and let you be hungry, let you be hungry. I thought that just kind of happened because they were out in the wilderness and they just kind of ran out of food. No, God took them a particular journey so that there would not be any food so that what would happen? So that they would cry out to God and look to him for their sustenance, for their food, yes. But also notice this, he fed them with manna which they did not know nor did their fathers know that he might make them understand that man does not live by bread alone but man lives by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. There it is that that God was orchestrating these events with a view towards spiritual work that needed to be done in them to prepare them for what lay ahead. And yet, tragically, with many of them, they said, don't want anything of it. And so they would suppress it. They would reject it. They would wander. Interesting, later on in this passage, look at verse 16. In the wilderness he fed you with manna which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and that he might test you, here it is, to do good for you in the end. What looked bad on first blush was actually intended to do good in the end. Better to experience hardship now and comfort later than comfort now and hardship later. And that's really the model for us. Better to submit to the pains of life now, looking forward to the comforts of of heaven later, than to take it all now and miss out on that perfect joy and rest that God has promised to those who will follow. You know, it's precisely because these challenges and threats and trials uh, were out of their control, and by the way, out of our control, and are not anticipated that they can function the way they do, to humble us, to teach us. Isn't that true? For pain to be an effective tutor, it must be unanticipatable and um, unable to figure it out, out of our control. And that's true. Um, God, uh, I think otherwise, we would insert ourselves in the process in anticipation of what we know is happening and we would spoil the teaching process. It's precisely because we are out of control. It's precisely because we come to the end of our resources that we turn to God and say, help thou me in the midst of my trouble. It's there in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death that we find truly thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That conviction is only hypothetical and theoretical until we are there in the valley of the shadow of death. It is a truth, I think, from beginning to end of Scripture that God leverages all of our human experiences in our lives to build us up in trust to humble us, really to see what's in our hearts, to expose to us what's in our hearts that we might see. I mean, what if, and I think this is true, what if this reality is not an accident of God's plan, but it's rather a feature of God's plan? It's not merely that trouble happened, No, it was that trouble was designed by God and leveraged by God to teach us. That's why God works all things after the counsel of his own will. That's why Paul will say uh, God works all things together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. You know, that's just simply a platitude unless you really understand the import of this. No, 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 no. God truly is in these things, these lacks, these losses, these pains, these trials, these frustrations, these confusions, these overwhelming... All of that, God would delight to to use for some divine and holy purpose. You and I, like them, need to be weaned off of many fleshly desires, merely human commitments. It's not that these things are sometimes not good in and of themselves, it's that they can be used for bad. Bad. 
And sometimes we have to be weaned off of them. Sin itself is, is blinding. You know, John Owen, the great Puritan writer says, sin deadens and it darkens. That's how dangerous it is. Progressively deadens and dark, darkens. He goes on later in that book to say, be killing sin or it will be killing you. That our commitment to sin that we will not give up could keep us from heaven as a lost person. We're so committed to our sensual pleasures, our sensual desires, whatever lust it is, power, sex, whatever it is, that we're so committed to that that we would miss out on the promised land to satisfy this temporal, fleeting, passing, limited pleasure. One of my favorite books is uh, The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. It's a, an allegory about heaven and hell. It really is a justification for heaven and hell. Why there must be a heaven and a hell. And it's a series of vignette stories where people from hell meet people from heaven on the outskirts of heaven. By the way, it could never happen. <laughs> But they get on a bus and they come up on the outskirts of heaven and they meet people from heaven who come out the doors of heaven to meet them and to persuade them uh, to enter into rest. You can see heaven on the horizon. Will you not repent now and enter in? By the way, it can't happen, but it's illustrating a story. And C.S. Lewis in a series of short little stories is explaining why it is that these people from hell um, went to hell. And one of those individuals was called the sensualist. And this is what C.S. Lewis talks about. The, the enslaving power of sin at times. The sensualist, I'll allow you, begins by pursuing a real pleasure, though a small one, he says, the time comes, however, when the pleasure becomes less and less and the craving fiercer and fiercer, and though he knows that joy can never come that way, yet he prefers to joy in heaven the mere fondling of unappeasable lust, and he would not have it taken from him. He's so committed to the satisfying of that temporal finite lust. He'd fight to the death to keep it. He'd like well to be able to scratch, but even if he can scratch no more, he'd rather itch than not. He prefers unappeasable lust to the joys before him. That's how blinding and darkening sin can be, how enslaving it can be. You know, we, um, in our walk, um, we're on a journey just like them. We too experience threats, challenges, unanticipated, frightening things. I know our family, two months ago, June 1st, I remember it vividly. Little Leah comes down the stairs at seven o'clock and she's alarmed that her, her left side of her body is numb and tingly and the numb and tingly is not a, an unusual thing with her arm. You know, she'd sleep on it and that would happen. And she would shake it off and it would go, but it would not, it would not relieve. And it was in her entire left side and it was a frightening thing. And so she wakes me up and we're standing there and then we're walking around to see if it would waken up and it wouldn't. And all of a sudden we're standing there in the middle of the room and all we could do is embrace one another. And Leah says, can you pray for me? And so there we were in our weakness, crying out to God who knows all and sees all, a compassionate Lord and Savior and say, we are in your hands, help us. And we raced to the hospital and we uh, went and got an MRI and it confirmed that there was a stroke in her brain and that it caused the left, entire left side of her body to be weak and, and, and tingly and numb. And, and uh, boy, it began the journey. I mean, it was really frightening there the first couple of days, but God in his mercy, he was with us. And God rallied many of God's people to come by and to see us and to pray for us. And we were praying like crazy. You don't think you pray in desperation in a situation like that? There's nothing you can do. You can't see the enemy. 
I mean, it's there in the inner part of the brain. You can't touch it. And yet God sees all and he knows all. And what a journey it's been of, of trust, of faith, in realizing that, that, that God was not on vacation when that happened. He wasn't absent. He saw everything. And God in his providence, for reasons we do not know, I mean, it's hard to answer the why questions when something like this happens. We just simply have to say, you know what, God, you're in control. We are yours. We are your servants. Be pleased to do your work in us and to give ourselves to God for whatever holy work he's wanting to do there. And it's been quite a journey. And and again, many of you have been a part of the healing and and sending your notes and messages and encouragements. And I mean, some of it, uh, I haven't been able to respond to all of them, but several hundred messages in. And and, uh, one guy said, I was on a bike ride just recently. And I was, uh, one of the guys was a uh, pediatric neurologist. And he said, you know what? I had a uh, 14-year-old boy that had a thalamic stroke. And it was both sides of the body that were numb and tingly. And he had a full recovery. And so we could share that with Leah and say, that's, that's an encouraging word there. Um, and there were many examples of God's orchestrating events in finding the right doctor and an opportunity to see this specialist and, and uh, just seeing how God is, is, is in this and we're still on the journey. And there's still the healing process, but we're thanking God and praising God for what he has been able to uh, do. This unanticipated thing, this event that exposes us in our true weakness, something we can do nothing about in our own abilities, and we just simply have to give ourselves to God, this faithful creator who will do what is right and good. I can think of my own journey of singleness and how God orchestrated delay for decades for his good pleasure, and how frustrating it was, how difficult the journey was, how difficult the journey was in in, uh, waiting on God and becoming frustrated and saying, well, this idiot's getting married, what's what's wrong with me? Um, I mean, there were times there when I couldn't buy a date. It was, (laughs) uh, it, it, it seemed like God had conspired against me. And it was not until I was 44 that I was able to get married. And yet, you know what, I look back on that and I see God was in it. And I still remember vividly, short story, I still remember vividly the moment that that a lot of this kind of coalesced and came together and I said, okay, I can trust you. I very flippantly was doing a Bible study down in Dallas. I just kind of pulled some verses together in the book of Job. I said, okay, this will be a good one, you know. Um, and I just kind of stood up there and started teaching and preaching. And before long, I realized I was preaching to myself. And I could barely choke back the tears because it was the dagger was driving in. It was deep. And it was exposing me in my lack of faith, in my lack of trust, in my willfulness, in my fleshliness in my unwillingness to trust God in the absence of knowing what was going on. And I remember vividly a portion of Job uh, where it, uh, Elihu, the young guy, uh, he responds to Job and it's pretty, pretty sober counsel there. And he says, he says, beware Job, lest your wrath entice you to scoff at God and just simply to bail out. And I think that really stunned me. Was I flirting with unbelief because of what I could not have that I thought I should have, that I had a right to? Beware, Job, lest your wrath entice you to scoff at God and bail out. Then he said this, do not let the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. All that Job had experienced was something of a ransom that God had determined, that God was demanding for, for freedom for what God was delighting to do in Job. Trust me, Job, trust me. I know this is a great high price that I'm I'm calling upon you to pay, but will you walk with me just a little bit longer? Do not let the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. And then this one, again, I almost broke down in tears. I said, God is exalted in the heavens, Elihu said. God is exalted in the heavens. Who is a teacher like him? Meaning he is the inscrutable teacher. He is the consummate teacher. He weaves all the circumstances of life together to do what he delights to do. And I was willing to settle for this and God wanted this. This. 
There was abundance waiting me on the table, but I was demanding this. And in my brilliance of my pea brain, I was going up against the infinite wisdom of an eternal God. Yeah, that's a brilliant move, Charles. And yet it was, it was a moment, yes, of, recogni- of resignation, but it was also one of rest. And it was shortly thereafter that I met Melanie. <laughs> I'd seen her. Uh, she had three kids, and I said, no. <laughs> but God turned my heart. <sighs> and I said, I'm not even going to ask her for a date unless I could see myself in that kind of a situation. And I'm promising you, the Holy Spirit changed my heart to not where I would kind of reluctantly do that, but delightfully do that. That it would be seen as a privilege to enter into the life of her and her three kids and to build a family. What a high privilege. And then, and then I knew I shouldn't go here. <laughs> but then, a year later, a year later, little Leah comes along. And so we have four. And we got two boys and two girls, and wow, what a ride. You know, Tom told me, you're, you're about to go from zero to 60 in about two and a half seconds. <laughs> and he wasn't lying. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, whoa, God was faithful. There was so much that I could not see. There was so much around the corner I couldn't anticipate. But God truly was faithful. I will never leave you or forsake you. There's nothing too great with, with my power at your disposal. That's what it means to walk by faith. It's not to know everything. It's not to know the future. It's to say above everything else, my delight is to do your will, O God. Like Jesus said, my food is to do your will, O God. It's to learn from Israel in the wilderness. It's not about food to satisfy your belly or water to satisfy your thirst. It's about the living and abiding word of God that you should delight in. It's what Jesus said when he said uh, you should see righteousness as your, your food. Hunger and thirst after righteousness, that is food that can satisfy forever. Take care, verse 12, back in Hebrews 3. We better close this off, I'm uh, over time. Take care, brethren, that there be not in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. And then he says this, and this is wonderful, but encourage one another. Isn't that interesting? That in terms of battling doubt, battling confusion, we do it together in many ways. We walk together. We help one another. We pray for one another. A whole series of one another is there. Encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Did you know that we all have a role to play in encouraging one another and walking with one another in this difficult wilderness experience? I think it's Paul who says that through many trials and tribulations you must enter the kingdom of God. And he he ain't lying. It's at times very difficult and trying, and yet God is with us in this. Maybe that's why Peter can say, Beloved, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing, as though some strange thing were happening to you. I mean, if you'd study the Old Testament, you would know this. (laughs) That's interesting. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of of his glory, you may rejoice with exaltation. How about that? That we can exult in God when he returns because we were faithful. 
Or how about James? Consider it all joy. Again, that's a platitude for most of us. But when we think carefully about that, no, truly, genuinely, consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I mean, these are difficult lessons, to be sure. Wow. To experience his severe mercy, we don't, we don't like that, but even his severe mercy is mercy. I'll end with this illustration, truly. This is, this is the masterful A.W. Tozer. There's no one that writes like him, you know, that preaches like him. Just a master wordsmith, and he gives this one illustration that I, I won't even take time to interpret it because you'll, you'll know what he's talking about. Now the hammer is a useful tool, but the nail, if it had feelings and intelligence, could present another side of the story. For the nail knows the hammer only as an opponent, a brutal, merciless enemy who lives to pound it into submission, to beat it down out of sight and to clinch it into place. That is the nail's view of the hammer, and it is accurate except for one thing. The nail forgets that both it and the hammer are servants of the same workman. Let the nail but remember that the hammer is held by the workman and all resentment toward it will disappear. The carpenter decides whose head will be beaten next and what hammer shall be used in the beating. That is his sovereign right. When the nail has surrendered to the will of the workman and has gotten a little glimpse of his benign plans for its future, it will yield to the hammer without complaint. The file is more painful still, for its business is to bite into the soft metal, scraping and eating away the edges till it has shaped the metal to its will. Yet the file has in truth no real will in the matter but serves another master, as the metal also does. It is the master and not the file that decides how much will be eaten away, what shape the metal shall take, and how long the painful filing shall continue. Let the metal accept the will of the master, and it will not try to dictate when or how it should be filed. As for the furnace, it is the worst of all. Ruthless and savage, it leaps at every combustible thing that enters it and never relaxes its fury till it has reduced it all to shapeless ashes. All that refuses to burn is melted to a mass of helpless matter without will or purpose of its own. When everything is melted that will melt and all is burned that will burn, then and not till then, the furnace calms down and rests from its destructive fury. Isn't that the way we feel sometimes? I mean, we're the nail, the hammer, the, the file, ooh, the furnace, oh no. And yet if we realize who's in control of this, the master carpenter, the Lord and sovereign, who sees all, who knows all, whose wisdom, yes, is inscrutable, but is perfect and holy and good and pure, and he desires to do good in the end. Trust in that. Trust in that. Let's pray. Oh, Father, thank you for the encouragement of the word of Scripture that, that this truly is heavenly counsel that you have offered to us. Oh, God, that we might be students who would learn from the holy book and that we might submit to your, your gracious workings. Yes, sometimes a severe mercy, but a mercy nonetheless. Might we delightfully submit to you. Might we draw near to you to seek uh, comfort and counsel and wisdom. Might we be students of the word of God and find what you have placed here for our encouragement, for our instruction. Oh, God, be with us as we leave this building that we might truly be a picture of Christ to a world that is racing towards a doom. Oh, God, that we might be light in the midst of darkness. For your sake and in your name we pray. And all God's people said.
Amen.